You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Inches to go. The Vader. 17 to 14. Cowboys out in front. Star begins to count. Takes the snap. He's... Pass is picked off, and who is it? Big B.J. Raji for the touchdown. Puck fake. Wallace picked off. Nick Collins. Nick Collins on the return inside the 10. Leaps for the touchdown. What's up, guys? Welcome to Packers Total Access Post Game Show. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. And uh, this was a tough loss today as the Packers fall to the Jets at Lambeau 27 to 10. As you guys uh, may have already noticed, I'm going to be flying solo today, which is totally cool. I know Jacob had a few things come up. So, um, we're just going to kind of hang out for a little bit, talk about the game. And, and like I said, this was a tough one to stomach, man. It was a, a tough loss. The offense sputtered early and often. We're going to talk about all that. Um, we're going to talk about how the defense really kept them in the game for quite some time before everything kind of unraveled there in the second half. The goal of this is is to to try not to come across as doom and gloom. You know, the Packers have now lost drop. They have now dropped two in a row. And it seems as if, if I remember correctly, this is the first time that Matt LaFleur has lost two games in a row. So not the end of the world, but the Packers are definitely uh, definitely struggling at the time being. But what we're going to do is go to the podium here. I believe we've got Coach Matt LaFleur up there right now. So let's see what he has to say um, about the game today. What was the trouble? I got to go back and look. He gets injured and comes right back out and – um, but yeah, I think everything's on the table moving forward in terms of trying to get our best people out there to give us the best opportunity to move the football. Was there any consideration of putting Yash on the right side? Is that something, if not, that, that you'll have to revisit this week? I think, like I said, I think everything's on the table. Matt, you talk about adversity. You haven't had to deal with a ton of regular season adversity since you've been here. Um, and, and you brought up some stuff like making evaluations. How, how challenging is that in season, looking in the mirror when you've got games just up one after yeah, well, if you don't correct yourself, it really doesn't matter what you come up with. So we can sit here and study the opponent all we want. Um, but if we don't fix ourselves first, it, it doesn't matter what we put in front of our players. What was the level of difficulty with uh, Aaron and his thumb? Uh, yeah, I, I got to give him a lot of credit. I, he, he battled through it, man, and uh, I know he was hurting. But... You know, he's a tough, he's a tough competitor. He's one of the toughest I've ever been around. So uh, give him credit for, for hanging in there. So did you think most of his inaccuracy today was directly caused by the thumb? Well, I mean, anytime you, you go that route, then you're just, it comes across as an excuse. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that. Um, you know, I, I do think that, there was there was a lot of things that were factoring in to to some of the, some of the struggles we had offensively and you know quite frankly like, like I said before it's it's hard to throw with a bunch of pressure in your face too and I got to go back and look at everything and, and just you know calm down and, and take a good hard look at what we put out there today because um, 
like I said, give them a ton of credit. They, uh, they obviously were well prepared for us and went out there and, and did a much better job of not only coaching, and, but executing. You said he liked the fight, keeping them out of the end zone on that last drive, but I mean, they take over with 9-12 left, and everybody in the building knows how to run the football, and they were able to run really effectively on you guys. You missed some tackles. Was, when, you look back, when you look at that tomorrow or tonight, what do you think you're going to see from your defense on that drive? Yeah, just what you said. I mean, we, we I thought there was a couple positions where we were in to make a tackle, and uh, you know, you, you got to make those. You can't you, when when everybody in that building knows you're going to run the football, and they're able to do it. I mean, that's a little discouraging. So whether it's we're not putting our guys in the best position or it's a lack of execution, I think we got to go back and look at it. Was was Aaron Joel? I know Aaron got. Hobbled, I think, in the third quarter, but was he hot? Was he slowed all during the games? I think he had three carries in the first half. Yeah, yeah, it's not good enough. Do you feel like you're just still kind of groping on offense, or do you feel like there's you have some things that you can lean on at this point? Um, I don't think there's many things we're leaning on very well right now. You say it's not good enough to get Aaron the three carries in the first half. Did, was that the game plan coming in? Because it seemed like early downs you were trying to, to get the run game going and they just seemed to shut the door on a third defensive front early in the game. Yeah, no, they did a nice job. And like I, like I said early on, it just felt like we were in a lot of get back on track situations. And, you know, you're, you're trying to keep out of the third and long situations. And it's hard when you get into um, – when you run the ball on first down, you don't get much. Um, and it felt like there wasn't a lot of room to get to get anything going, quite frankly, um, to to want to sit there and try to do it again, and then you're in third and long. So I, I got to go back and look at it, though. Um, evaluate myself as a play caller and see where, where we got to improve. Matt, the one thing that even as the defense and the offense was trying to find itself the last couple of weeks, had been your special teams. What did you see on the block punt and the block field goal? Because it seemed like Rich had had you guys pass that kind of stuff happen. Yeah, I mean, again, that's another thing I had to go look at. Uh, I know, like, on the block field goal, there was a high snap which slowed down the operation, but it, it, there was leakage on the right side. Um, and. You know, I talked to Rich about it, and uh, I'm not quite sure what, what transpired on the punt. Uh, I'll have a better answer for you guys tomorrow. <clears throat> All right, so Coach Matt LaFleur there at the podium, obviously, uh, you know, he pretty down, right? Why wouldn't he be? <laughs> but I want to talk about something. Um, the running on first down, right? We all pounded the table all week long. We got to run the football more. We got to run the football more. You heard me and Ryan have a conversation about it. When the run's working, who cares if they got a heavy box? My angle is a little bit different from Ryan's. Maybe not different. Probably not the right way of saying it. But me, it was more along the lines of what place are you at in the game, right? What what's the score? How much time is left? Okay, now we can afford. Let's let's run it into a heavy box, right? Well whether it was my angle that I took or, you know, Ryan's approach or virtually everyone else on Twitter, we all said, we got to run the ball more. We got to run the ball more. The thing that stood out to me the most early in this game was we ran the ball more. We ran the ball on first down um, virtually every drive that I can remember in the first half. I've got notes here and I, I could be off on a couple, but over and over and over run stuffed on first down, run stuffed on first down. And what that does is it puts you in second and long. And when you get into second and long, whether you convert or not, most of the time, even if you, uh, you know, complete a pass or gain yardage on second and long, you're faced with a third down. One of the things that I've noticed about the league this year, um, I heard Lombardi talking about it, heard several other people talk about it. Gone are the days of trying to get the third manageable. Teams are really trying to pick up the first down on second down. And it sounds silly because you want to get a first down on every snap, every single play you'd like to get a first down. But it seems like teams are being a little more aware of trying to um, get that chunk of yardage on second down so you're not even having to face a third down, if that makes sense. And 
you know, it's funny because when I heard him talk about that, um, I immediately thought, ah, that's silly. Probably how most of you are thinking right now, hearing my voice, um, whether you're watching live here on Twitter or YouTube or listening on the podcast on Monday morning. But during this game, I found myself going, Hark, I think I know what he's talking about now, you know? And uh, yeah, so let's go to the notes here. Let's just kind of look. And uh, and like I said, the Jets come out with a 27 to 10 victory. Appreciate you guys tuning in, hanging out with us. Um, you know, I've got five things that really, to me, stood out in the game, uh, most of which are negative. And this isn't a podcast to just try to be a Debbie Downer, right? We we want to talk about exactly what happened in the game. And can the back can the Packers rebound? Can the Packers adjust and fix these things, right? And for me, the blocked field goal completely changed the game there. I mean, when when the when the field goal was blocked in the second quarter by Quentin Williams, which I'm going to tell you right now, Quentin Williams is a dog. You guys heard me talk about it on the last podcast where I was kind of previewing this game. And, uh, you know, he's this defense is good. <laughs> I compared them to the 49ers defense of a couple years ago. When you look at their PFF grades and exactly how everything's unfolding for the Jets right now, you can tell that Robert Sala is starting to put together that 49ers defense, or at least attempting to. They've got great edge rushers. They're grading out really well. Quentin Williams, a great anchor there in the middle, just like they had for so long with their interior defensive line. And that front front four for the Niners were, were solid. They still are today, but in the heyday there, you know, two, three years ago, when all these guys were together, you know, Sala as the defensive coordinator, obviously Shanahan there. You know, you, you had uh, McDaniel, which is the head coach of the Miami Dolphins. Obviously, he was in-house there. So many of those guys. Uh, heck, uh, Kevin O'Connell was in house, you know, he's now with the Vikings, which the Vikings won again today. They're now five and one. Seems like a really good hire by them. Um, but this defense is is kind of built like the Niners. This was no pushover defense. Their young cornerback tandem is a solid tandem. I'm seeing people on Twitter say that the Packers are losing to bad teams. I don't see it that way. I don't see the New York Giants as a bad team. Are they great? Heck no. But neither are the Packers. The Packers are not a team that's just going to run away with 14 or 15 wins. You know, I said it last week. I said it in the offseason um, that this is not a team that's just going to guarantee 13 wins, right? And, you know, I did a little roundtable with some other podcasters in the offseason. Uh, as soon as the schedule came out, we looked at the schedule and kind of predicted it. And I don't think there was one person I talked to that didn't say the Packers would win 13 games, you know. I've seen it more – in the 11 to 12 win range, I, at one point I found myself dipping all the way down to 10, and I thought, nah, that seems a little low. I, you know, maybe I'm being too negative. Um, but I was definitely going with the, you know, the consensus that I came up with was 12 wins. Again, I didn't expect them to beat Tampa. They go down there and beat Tampa. Um, I expected them to beat the Giants. They get beat by the Giants, so it was kind of a push. Now, with this loss to the Jets, I really thought the Packers would beat the Jets. Um but you've got to give credit to the Jets and the momentum they're creating. I mean, they're they're a team that's built for the type of game that was played today. One or two breaks on special teams, and they got a chance to win the ball game, right? Zach Wilson didn't throw the ball all, all across the yard, right, by no stretch of the imagination, but he managed the game. Um, so the block field goal and then, of course, the block punt later in the game, you know, for the touchdown, those were the two killers for the Packers. So here we've got special teams rearing its ugly head again, right? Um, now, I feel like the special teams has been very improved up to this point. So what kind of adjustments are we going to make moving forward, right? That's what it really comes down to. So as we go through the notes, though, again, first down run stuffs, that's the big thing that stood out to me. Um, Rodgers showed poor accuracy early, but I feel like he got it together a little bit later in the game there. Um, Dean Lowry kind of showed up, you know, had a nice run stop there in the first quarter. Um, one thing that I did make a note and it's kind of, kind of tedious and, uh, Daniel's in the house. Daniel says we spent Daniel. It sure looked like we were spent today, brother. I, I agree with you, man. It was a, a rough game to watch. Appreciate you hanging out with us though. Um, Jair jawing, um, you know, with receivers after the play and Jair played a pretty good ball game. He did have one catch on him there. That was, it was kind of ugly coverage, but him jawing after the play is going to get a penalty called just like Russell. It seems like they've toned Russell down just a touch. But, you know, there was so many games early in the year where he was ripping the ball out of receivers' hands after the whistle was blown. And I was like, man, he's going to get a penalty. He's going to get a penalty. And then last week, you've seen it happen. Whether you agree with the call or not, the point is 
doing that jawing after the play, doing that ripping of the ball out of the hands at the end of the play, what that's going to do is get officials looking for that stuff for, for individual players. And um, that's, that's in my opinion, that's why Russell got that ticky-tacky call last week. And uh, I just made that note here with Jair because he plays emotional and he's a heck of a player. I love to see him uh, following Garrett Wilson around today. And you got to give credit to Barry, you know. Again, just like running the ball into a big pile of defensive, uh, you know, big defenders, we ran the ball early like we wanted, and it didn't go anywhere. And then on defense, we wanted Barry to switch things up. He did. Jair was following Garrett Wilson there for a little bit. They played a little more man coverage today. I have to go look at the tape. They do a good job disguising things, so it's hard for me to catch it in real time. Greg Olson was doing a good job on the – on the broadcast, or I actually listened to the announcers today. I like Greg Olson, though. He gives you a little bit of – he gives you some good insight. But he was talking about how, you know, they were playing a little more man coverage, right? So uh, the big thing that stood out to me from the offensive perspective and why we could not get any momentum was just the pressure on Aaron Rodgers. That right side is a liability, period. I didn't see – Many, if all, individual plays that stood out to me where it was Elton Jenkins' fault. But Royce Newman, to me, looked like he had a bad day. And, you know, Josh Myers, I wouldn't I wouldn't go as far as saying he had a bad day, but those two together is just a disaster waiting to happen. Um, I don't think they should be, you know, necessarily benched, although when Royce did go out of the game and Hanson came in, the Packers caught a little spark. And the second that Royce came back in, lo and behold, they had some more breakdowns on that side of the – of the line, you know, like I said, from a, a 40,000 foot bird's eye view to me, it seemed as if they were picking on Royce Newman. They found a weak link. John Runyon solid. David Bakhtiari, to the best of my knowledge, played the majority, if not all the snaps, which is a good, a good thing. Um, Elton Jenkins, like I said, I felt like he held his own. The holding call really crushed me because all I could think about when they called that hold on Elton Jenkins was the screenshot I sent of the multiple defenders in chokeholds <laughs> against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the other people going, oh, come on, they could call holding on every play. That was a good example today. To me, that didn't seem like a hold on Jenkins. But at the same time, man, it, you know, it's a fast-paced game, and the officials definitely were not the reason that the Packers lost this game. If anything, I felt like the Packers got more calls than the Jets did, and, and I do feel very – very confident and comfortable saying that. But Pat O'Donnell showed a lot of consistency. Again, heck of a punter, did a great job. You hated to see that punt get blocked and return for a touchdown. Don't feel like it was on him. You know, Coach LaFleur just said in the presser a second ago, he said, uh, you know, it was a high snap, which obviously uh, slows down the pace of the punt. And when I watched it on replay, I did not notice the high snap, in, you know, in real time. But it did seem like Pat O'Donnell took a long time to get the ball off his foot. And now after hearing, you know, Coach LaFleur say that along with the leaky right side, it, it kind of makes sense now. But, again, though, he's punted great. You know, he pinned them inside uh, inside the 20 a couple of times, um, done a great job flipping field position as the offense struggled there early on. Again, then Dean Lowry had another batted ball down. Dean played a pretty good game. I'm expecting his PFF grade to be pretty solid. It just seems like they're taking him off the field a lot. And, and this is one of those things where you've got, you know, Jaron Reed you picked up in free agency. He's coming in and spelling Dean from time to time, especially on rundowns, what, what seems like rundowns. Um, and uh, Devontae Wyatt just must not be there yet because we haven't seen much of him, you know. Um, A.J. Dillon just – he does not look like the same running back than last year. And, and maybe I'm overreacting. If I am, you guys hit me up in the comments, hit me up on Twitter. It just feels like he doesn't have that burst. It feels like he doesn't have the hands coming out of the backfield. And I was as excited about the pony package as anyone, the, the pony package being the, the package where you've got both Aaron Jones and uh, A.J. Dillon in the backfield. But it just seems like it slows down the entire offense when they're on the field together right now. You know, there's some people that are saying that uh, Christian Watson's a bust already after five games. That cracks me up. Well, Christian Watson wasn't playing in this game. And I'll tell you this, the jet sweep aspect of this offense is gone. Now, there was many people last week that were, were saying, let's just stop with the jet sweeps already. They're not working. We ran minimal jet sweeps today, and the offense looked worse. You've got to have that horizontal stretching of the field, that aspect of the offense, to make this offense go, in my opinion. Um, so, 
got a lucky penalty there on the on the Jets sideline. Like I said, it just felt like there was multiple times in this game that the officials kind of kept the Packers in it, not intentionally, but it's just kind of the flow of the game and how things happen. That's what it uh it really felt like to me. Um, but you know, you take the good with the bad, right? You, you're going to catch a break every now and again, and when you do, you try to capitalize on it. And I feel like the Packers did there for a short stint. So um, let's do this, guys. Let's, let's go ahead and take a pause here as we're going through the notes. We've got Aaron Rodgers at the podium. Let's see what QB1 has to say about this ball game. But, again, it's, it, a lot of it's, I'm, I'm sure, and I haven't, I haven't seen the film yet, but a lot of it's very simple mistakes. So we're making simple mistakes on complex plays. Uh, to me, the natural response is to simplify things even more or – you know, if you need to make uh, some moves, you make some moves. Hey, Aaron, um, Bill mentioned how you guys haven't faced a lot of adversity, regular season adversity with how many games you've won. Matt was in here earlier. He said the phrase he said was, there has to be an urgency to want to improve. When you talk about manifesting and staying steady, do you have to make sure that, that younger guys or guys that have not experienced the adversity that you have during regular seasons understand what it takes to get things back on track if they don't really have experience turning things around? Uh, yes, but the biggest thing is to guard against the freak out, you know, to guard against the feeling into the wobbliness um, and to let that creep into your mind. Um, like I said, if the preparation is good enough in the wins, it's got to be good enough in the losses. The execution is obviously different. So. It's always good to, with a fine tooth comb, go back over your own stuff. You know, be very critical of yourself, your preparation for the week, your performance, your mindset, all that stuff, and then make tweaks that need to be made. But for me, I'm not going to change. You know, the the standard is the standard. I'm going to try to play that standard I set for myself. But the preparation that I go through is going to stay the same. The the way I show up to practice and during the week with enthusiasm and energy is going to stay the same. I expect the other guys to do the same. You know, as a rookie, as a young player, you got to fall in the line. Um, but I'm not going to freak out or, or have, you know, make any grand statements. I'm just going to get back to what I do best, go through the process, you know, have real good conversations with Matt and our staff and, and try and get this thing fixed. Because those guys care about it. They put in a hell of a lot of time. Um, you know, it's... it's demoralizing, I'm sure, you know, to be grinding the way they do and us to go out there and play so crappy on offense. So we got to fix it as a group. Um, the players got to step up, though. The best teams are player-led teams. So it's time for us as players on both sides of the ball and on teams to, like, take the – truly take ownership of that. And I can't explain to you exactly what that looks like with an eight-step process, but it's a mindset. And until we get that mindset, we're going to be wallowing – in this, uh, you know, inconsistency. Yeah. Early, Early in your career, I remember as a starter, how much you put into your leadership role. You got to know different guys. You got to know what made them tick, especially in 2010. That was an up and down year with injuries and stuff. Um, do you have the energy for that now? Or does your relationship change now because of your status and your stature and who you are? Do you need the coaches or do you need someone like Alan Lazar to do some more of that fine detail type of motivation or introspection? No, I got a lot of energy. I, I care about this a lot. And I'm always uh, keeping a tight pulse on the team and having those conversations with the leaders of the football team, making sure we're putting our arms around guys that need need that love and, and uh, attention, and then holding guys accountable. So that's what, uh, that's the fun part of this game, is the relationships. So I'm going to, you know, be walking around with a watchful eye, making sure we're all uh, taking care of our business and thinking about things the right way and, and still riding high with confidence. But, uh, yeah, I got plenty of energy for that. You talk on um, You've heard about everybody on the side, from Alan to Sammy and so on. You also talk a lot about your relationship with Brian. Do um, you have enough horses, do you think? Do you think what you have right now is good enough to get to where you want to get to? Well, we'll see. We need, we need Sammy back. I think that's happening here pretty soon. Cobby's 
you know, yeah, I'm guessing I'll be out for a little bit. bit. Um, Brian, I've had uh, uh, a number, number of conversations. conversations. Um, I trust them on the staff. Uh, if they feel like they need to add, that they will. Um, I think there's enough on this team uh, to be a successful team. Uh, there's the possibility of certain guys emerge of us having a chance to make a run. Um, I know Brian believes the same thing, uh, but if there's an opportunity, uh, I would expect that Brian will be in the mix. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I don't want to bore you guys too much with just press conference talk here, but we definitely want to hear from the players and the coaches as that stuff comes in. Let me say this. I love what Roger said there, that, Great teams are player-led teams, right? And, you know, this is something, like I told you guys on a past podcast, I got a chance to study uh, under um, Coach Krzyzewski, Coach K at Duke. I hate basketball, which is hilarious, right? I mean, you know, close practice with uh, at, at Cameron, with Coach K, hearing him coach and teach and all those things and talk about leadership at a, at a lunch and a dinner and all that. And he said the same thing. It was like, we want our t- our teams to be led by the players, period. And, you know, what Roger said to me is so true. Great teams are player-led teams. Those players have to step up. If indeed they are the superstars that everybody talks about them being, everybody has talked about how this defense is absolutely loaded with talent. And last week it was fire Joe Barry. He plays too vanilla scheme. They play too soft. Get Barry out of here. Well, they changed it up this week. Jair was following Garrett Wilson. They were playing press up on the line. Lo and behold, they throw a deep shot. Eric Stokes gets turned around, doesn't have the awareness to find the ball. I don't understand that, and I'm going to be critical here for a minute. I'm a fat 40-year-old white guy is how I see myself. I'm not a world-class athlete, okay? Um, Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. To see a DB who has the athleticism that Eric Stokes has take off deep into coverage, run stride for stride with the receiver, he's looking at the receiver, and to not be able to tell Hark the ball may be in the air right now. Let me turn around, or at least let me get a hand in his face. I, it blows me away. I see that play, and I go, that's not the coach's fault. He's on an island. Some people would disagree with that schematic and say, well, how's he out there on an island? Well, that's what we were screaming for all week long. We wanted a, a more aggressive defense. He's out there on an island, can't make a play. Darnell Savage. If you guys follow me on Twitter, and if you're watching on Twitter, I'm sure you do. It's why you got the notification. Darnell Savage irked me all day long. And and it's sad because I'm turning into the Darnell Savage hater. And I was one of the guys that was most excited about him being drafted. But the reason he irked me is there's no urgency to his game. He's got all that athleticism, all that burst, all that quickness. 
And every single time that they, they ran the ball against the Packers, he was on his heels. I showed two different plays on Twitter, and immediately one fan points out that it was Quay Walker's fault that missed the tackle. Quay Walker did miss a tackle. What I'm pointing out is why is Savage playing patty cake 10 yards away from the line of scrimmage? He he sees that the ball is in a ball carrier's hands and it's not a pass. Why is he not attacking the ball? And it happened over and over. The reverse to Berrios, the jet, whatever you want to call it. He, he literally, you see the reverse. They hand the ball off to him. He continues to just kind of jab inside, get washed out of the play. And guess who was supposed to be out there on that edge preventing that touchdown? Savage. Now, you can say, well, at least he was being aggressive. Watch the play. He wasn't being aggressive. He was just lollygagging inside and gets washed out of the play. If you're not going to be 110% aggressive and attack the ball, then stay outside and prevent the touchdown. It's like every single time a big play happens. I'm going to challenge you guys. When a big play happens on defense, immediately go back and watch the play and look at Savage. Guys, he is the free safety. He is the center fielder. Name any great defense, any great defense in the history of the game. You can say the Baltimore Ravens, Ed Reed. Right? I mean, you, any of them, name them. Name the great defenses in the last 10, 15, 20 years. The Packers in 2010, the Super Bowl year, Nick Collins. You see what I'm saying? Heck with the 49ers. Now, he moved around a lot, played a lot of strong and free safety. Ronnie Lott, way back in the day, Ronnie Lott. Heck, the Packers in the 90s, why, were, why was that defense so good? Leroy Butler at safety. Now, he would play in the box and blitz, didn't play as much center field, but he always had – I can't even remember the other safety's name that he gave so much credit to during, you know, uh, during his Hall of Fame speech. Leroy Butler gave credit to this other safety. I can't remember his name, but he was talking about how, man, he allowed me to play free because that guy was such a stud at free safety and having my back. We do not have that at safety. We don't. And it's huge on defense. It's called safety for a reason. It's your last line of defense. It's the safe defender. It's the defender that's going to prevent – the touchdown from happening. It's the last line of defense. And it's like there's no urgency from him, none whatsoever. And uh, I, I feel like he's the weakest link in this defense. And, you know, sometimes when I say that, I feel like, you know, I go back and then look at the PFF grades. Go, I was off on that evidently. That's not been the case with Savage. Every single week he grades out bad. Maybe this is the week he does grade out good. I don't see it. I would be really, really surprised if he gets a decent grade this week. I would not be surprised at all if he grades out in the 30s again this week. I mean, anything anything above 50, I'll be like, okay, I missed it. Because I'm telling you, the guy just – he played like hot garbage. And I say that because he did it again today. One time he, he got into a jawing match with Russell Douglas. He pointed at the line, he pointed at Russell, and he just kind of shrugged his shoulders and walked like, this was on you. Every game he's pointing the finger at somebody. Every game. Last week it was Devondre Campbell. Now, isn't it amazing that when when the Packers are winning and he's not giving up big plays, there's no finger pointing. That's what Aaron Rodgers is talking about. You you have to have a player led team. That's not being a leader. And I know Rodgers is bad about shaking his head and putting his hands on his hips. That's what cracks me up. Rodgers puts his hands on his hips or cusses. And everybody's like, oh, what a crybaby. He's not a leader. Savage literally runs around the defense stomping like a little kid, pointing his finger at people, and nobody says a thing. And it's like the dude is holding this defense back, period. That's just – that's my opinion of him. So um, Rudy Ford, every time he's on the field, he flashes. Another positive point for me was in a bar a today. Um, really had a great game. Had a sack, had another run stop. Thought he played really, really well. Um and uh, like I said, A.J. Dillon just didn't didn't impress me much today. It seems like he's taking a step back. I don't know what it is. I can't quite put my finger on it. There was one play where the pass went out to him, and he literally stopped. He's three yards behind the line of scrimmage, swing pass, catches it, stops, looks at the defender like, which way are you going to go? Dude, you're 230, 40, 50 pounds, whatever he weighs now with those huge quads. You should catch that ball and go full speed into that DB. But for whatever reason, it was just hesitance, hesitant, hesitant, you know. Um, in the second quarter there, you know, Aaron Rodgers 
sacked over and over and over. It seemed like every drop back, Rodgers was getting hit. Then you had Pat O'Donnell pin him inside the 10. Great, great job punting once again. When he's protected, he's one of the best, one of if not the best punters in the league this year. Um, Jair Alexander played great. There was one play that he gave up, but they're, you know, here in the second quarter, played great. Perfect timing on a breakup. Again, got up, got in the guy's face. I'm going, please, Ja, don't, don't get a penalty here. Like, just go back to the huddle. Um, Amos provided pressure on uh, on uh, Zach Wilson on one play. Amos seemed like he showed up this week. I'm expecting his grade to improve from last week. So you're seeing some improvement here and there. Um, heck, Savage had a nice play in the second quarter. You got to give credit where the credit's due. He, he made a great play on a knockdown, right? So, um, and then obviously the Jets go up three to nothing right there. Um, the middle eight, when they went for it on fourth down during the middle, middle eight, I, I was livid. I'm like, because you guys know how I feel about that. The middle eight, meaning the overall score between both teams from four minutes left in the second quarter to the first four minutes of the third quarter, that's the middle eight. That really controls the momentum aspect of the game. That and turnover differential. Well, the Packers were already down, you know, one to nothing in the turnover differential. And it, to the best of my knowledge, that's how the game ended if you don't count the block punt as a turnover, which essentially it is, but it was just a swing of points. So it's even worse, to be honest with you, but we'll keep things into perspective. They lose the turnover differential one to nothing, right? Looks like Robbie Anderson's on his way out. I'm, I'm watching red zone right now, and he's jawing with the receivers coach on the sideline, so that don't look good down in Carolina. Um Wacky things going going on in the NFL today. Oh man, I lost my train of thought. But oh, middle eight. So we, the middle eight ended up being a push to the best of my knowledge. But it was in the middle eight that we decided to go for it on fourth down on our side of the field. And I'm like, why would you do that? There's time left. Pin them deep, and that's completely on the coaches. And somebody in the chat had kind of insinuated that that Rogers wanted to go for it. I don't care if Rogers wants to go for it. In that situation, Lafleur has got to grab his you-know-what and say, no, no, Aaron, we're punting the ball away. We're going to pin them deep and play the middle eight. Now, luckily, the defense got a big stop. We got the ball back, and it wasn't the uh, the end of the world there, right? I've got positive notes here on Cobby, on Dobbs, on Tunyon. Tunyon had a great game. He was a, a nice little safety valve there for Aaron throughout the entire game. Played really well. Let's do this. Let's just go to the uh, – I'm going to pull up the stats here real quick. And we'll kind of look and see exactly how everything played out from a statistical standpoint, and um, and go for there from there. But uh, the box score, let's see here. Let's look at the Packers on offense. So, Aaron Rodgers, twenty six of forty one for two hundred and forty six yards, only averaged six yards uh, per play. Right, one touchdown, no picks, uh, rating of eighty eight point one. Um, man, you had. You know, one or two big plays there in the passing game, but other than that, it was just dink and dunk all game, all game long. And do you blame him? I mean, he had defenders in his face the entire game, running the ball. Well, let's go to the receivers first. Like I said, Bob Tunyon, ten catches for ninety yards, um, had twelve targets, ten catches. Tunyon has some of the shortest hands in the game, and and to me, he doesn't look like he's completely healthy yet. He's playing a lot of the underneath game, a lot of the you know the small. The small stuff, uh, you know, short delay routes, leaks, leak plays, things like that. But 10 catches, 90 yards, that was a positive point. Alan Lazard, only four catches, 76 yards, but he had that touchdown. Um, you know, it's funny. You watch the game and you feel like someone had a good game, and then you go back and look at the statistics, and it's like, wow, I didn't realize he had that many targets. He had nine targets, only four catches, right? Um, yeah, Aaron Jones, Four targets, three catches for 25 yards. Of course, he was battling some kind of ankle or knee injury all game long. Um, Romeo Dobbs targeted nine times, only four catches for 21 yards. Guys, you have got to give the Jets credit. Again, Aaron Rodgers' thumb injured off the mark the, the majority of the game, but um, you got to give the Jets credit. Played great coverage. They really did. So running the ball, we all said all week long, don't care what it looks like, pound the rock, pound the rock, especially on them early downs, run into that heavy box, we don't care. Aaron Jones, nine carries, 19 yards, 2.1 yards per carry. Had a long of seven. I had a, a guy tweet at me on, on Twitter, and he said, man, we, we only got Aaron Jones that many touches. I mean, it's I'm with you. I want to see him get more touches. But at the tune of two yards per carry, I mean, come on. This was a game where the Jets were like, you know what, let's come in and shut down the run. And 
All week long, we were screaming, get away from the RPOs, right? Get away from the RPOs. Let's just run the football. We did that, and it didn't work. That's myself included, okay? I'm not trying to bash anybody individually. We all talked about it all week long. It just didn't work. Now, A.J. Dillon had 10 carries for 41 yards, 4.1 yards per carry. Um, pretty good average there. But, again, 10 carries, and we know how the second half was. We were down two touchdowns there the majority of the second half after that block punt for a touchdown, and now it was just time to air the ball out and try to get back in it, right? Um, so that's kind of how the statistics laid out on the defensive side of the ball. Devondre Campbell, eight tackles. Um, Adrian Amos, seven, seven tackles, one for a loss. Um, like I said, he had that play there where he actually rushed the quarterback as well. And uh, I thought Adrian Amos really showed up. Quay Walker, seven tackles, although – schematically to me, Quay didn't look like he had a good game. I'm expecting a low PFF grade again. Um, there's something off there. Like Ryan and I talked about, something's missing there, and I, I can't quite put my hand my in my finger on it. It's just something something's not clicking with Quay right now. And we got to take into consideration he is a rookie. He's a rookie linebacker, right? Um, Rashawn Gary had a good game, only four tackles, but he had a sack, two tackles for a loss, and a quarterback hit. Rashawn Gary was all over the place. I had a note here where Rashawn Gary, I believe it was um, – already flipped, flipped the page on it here, but I believe it was Gary and Reed that made a great play on the run, and then the very next play is when he got that sack. Rashawn Gary is a monster. We've got to get him locked up to a long-term contract. Uh, Jaron Reed, four tackles, and then uh, Jair Alexander, uh, three tackles, had three passes, defended, played a pretty good ball game. So that's kind of how the st uh, statistics lined up there for the, uh, for the Packers. Now – we got some injury news I want to kind of talk about, and uh, it sucks. You know, you seen Cobb leave the game. You heard Aaron kind of talk about it just now, um, said, you know, it looks pretty bad. He didn't say it looked bad, said it looks like he's going to be out for a while. I think it was LaFleur at the podium. Um, Rob Domofsky uh, tweeted out that he said that it uh, looks like uh, Cobb's injury was pretty bad, so we're going to be without Cobby for a little bit. Now, like Aaron said, we're going to be getting Sammy Watkins back for what that's worth. Don't really know. I mean, he played good early there um, when he was healthy, so we'll see how that plays out. But, yeah, the big uh, the big thing for me in this game, man, was Dylan had an off game. I know he averaged four yards a carry, but he had the crucial fumble there. That's what cost us the turnover differential. Um, another note, like I said, Savage just looked like hot garbage to me. That's not the guy I want playing free safety for this team, um, not at this point. And, and it's funny, we're what, how many years in now? How many years are we into this project with uh, with Darnell Savage? This is the uh, the fourth year, or no, the three complete years. I know they just picked up the fifth year option, which goes into effect next year. So yeah, this is the this is the fourth year, and um, we got him coming back for one more year. And I just don't see it, man. I don't see it. Um, got a comment here in the chat. Let's answer it. Mike says, "I've been a Packer fan since as long as I can remember, probably 1973. Trust me." They are entering a period of darkness similar to pre-1992. It's going to be bad. Um, I hope you're wrong, Mike. I understand the frustration. I obviously wasn't around back then. I was born in 82, <laughs> but definitely appreciate you holding down the fort during the 70s and 80s, you know, during that dark time. Um, I'm going to respectfully disagree, Mike. I'm going to say that uh, I don't believe that's going to happen and hope it doesn't happen, right? Um We'll just have to see how things play out, but definitely got to improve. And I think what Rogers said tonight is the direction we need to go in. You know, great teams are player-led teams, and they are not executing, himself included. They've got to get those guys together and go, all right, look, either we are who we say we say we are or we aren't. But to just let this fall on the coaches, that's, you know, I love the fact that Aaron went to bat for his coaches in the presser. Like, it's not the scheme. It's us players. And I hope somebody steps up on defense and says that because I don't get that vibe from Jair last week. I love Jair. I absolutely love him. But I didn't get that vibe from him. When you see Darnell Savage stomping around on the ground, jumping up and down like a three-year-old, pointing a finger at his teammates, I don't get the vibe from him either. Um, Devondre Campbell, I like his quiet leadership, and he seems to be one of the bright points on this defense right now. Um Maybe he's the one to step up and say it on defense. Maybe it's K, you know, KC. Maybe it's Kenny Clark. Maybe it's Rashawn Gary. Rashawn Gary's playing his tail off, and it sucks. You know, like we pointed out last week, Rasul Douglas' stupid penalty cost Gary a sack, and, and Gary's finally putting everything together. I feel like Preston's playing pretty solid. I feel like Kenny's playing pretty solid. 
Jaron Reed has been a pleasant surprise from time to time. But to me, it's the secondary. I think the secondary read their own clippings, man. They 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 did. They they bought into the hype more than anybody, in my opinion. Um, you know, Stokes on that deep pass. I mean, I'm telling you, I was blown away. I'm like, how do you not know to turn around right there? Like you're you're just running blindly down the field. You you see the it wasn't like it was a great Devontae Adams late hands catch either. The receiver adjusts, turns around, you see him square up to make the catch. Stokes is looking at him like, ooh. And it's you got to get your head around. You got to, you know. And uh, Mike in the chat says, appreciate your positive attitude, Clayton. I hope you're right. Man, it's funny you're saying I'm positive because I feel like I'm negative right now. I appreciate the kind words, but it's not the end of the world. You know, we've lost two in a row. It is what it is. Go back, scrap it, and, and get it back together. But the thing that stood out to me was we wanted to run early on first down. We did that, and we got our butts handed to us. Royce Newman, in my opinion, again, I have to go watch the tape, but just at first glance, it seemed like he had a bad game. That really kind of blew up that offensive line. I don't think it was necessarily all Elton Jenkins having a bad game. I I, I wouldn't be surprised if Elton grades out pretty decent. I think Royce is going to have a pretty bad grade. Maybe Josh Myers has a pretty bad grade. But, you know, what amazes me is there's not a whole lot going to the left. I don't feel like we lean on the strength of our offensive line. You don't see as many runs left. You know, and, and maybe it's, you know, what Ryan talked about on his pod, that it feels like A.J. Dillon's not running in the right place. Like he's he's kind of getting out of his gap and uh, and not running to the, to, the, the, to the design of the play. It seems like he bails out pretty easy, which is mind-boggling to me being that big. You think he would just trust the, trust the scheme, trust the gap, and hit it hard, right? But I feel like we need more plays to the left because the left side of the, uh, the offensive line seems to be the strength right now. Bakhtiari. I'm eager to see what his grade is because I feel like he played pretty well. John Runyon, what a godsend he's been. I think I think John Runyon has played left guard extremely well. And I don't think Josh Myers has been horrible. I don't. But that right side is really, really shaky. So if that's the case, let's play to our strengths, you know. So that's kind of how I see it. Um, again, I, d- I didn't want to get on here and just talk negative, but there's not a whole lot of positive to talk about. Hopefully I pointed out some insights just kind of from my perspective on how I've seen the game. And um, got to get back to the drawing board and, and just get better, man. That's what it comes down to. You've got to you got to come back next week and and just wipe the slate clean. And that's easier said than done. I get it. Um, but something's got to change. And I think that, like I said, we're kind of off to the right track with Aaron saying, hey, it's on the players. Now, hopefully the coaches will come out and say, hey, it's on the coaches. Maybe the coaches go have a meet and the players go have a meet and jerk a knot in each other's rear end and go, let's get this thing straightened out. If indeed we're as talented as, as everybody says we are, um, again, this defense was touted as being a top five defense. And I, I personally never seen it. But again, I was going, man, I hope they're right. That would be great. That'd be awesome. But here we are giving up, you know, however many points to the Jets here today, 27 points. That's just unbelievable. You can't look at that and say it's all on the offense. Yes, the offense should have scored more points, but we were not expecting the Packers' defense to give up 27 points to the Jets and however many points they gave up to the Giants last week. Now, we got the Commanders next week, guys. I was hesitant on the Giants game, but thought we would win. I was hesitant on the Jets game, but thought we would win. The Commanders, if the Packers lose to the Commanders, then this team – we're really starting to understand who this team is. And maybe it is headed down the path that Mike was just saying. But I really expect the Packers to come back and, and play a great game. I'm, you know, it, it sounds to me like Cobb is at least going to be out several weeks. He might go on IR and be done, be done for the rest of the year. It sucks because he was having a great year. He was having a great – it seemed like he was putting it together. And, and when you can see the tears in his eyes on the cart, man, I, God, it, it crushed me for him. It's like, my goodness, what a great guy, man. And you hate to see that happen to him, and especially someone who's got the most chemistry with Aaron Rodgers. But, you know, that's uh, that's the NFL. That's the National Football League. Not for long, man, with the way injuries happen in this game. You know, that's the way it happens. So let's do this. As we get ready to wrap up here, I want to say just a couple things here. Uh, let's look at the standings in the National Football Conference. Uh, obviously, the NFC, you got the Eagles as it sits right now. Let me go ahead and refresh this to make sure I'm getting you the most up-to-date information. We had games finished today. And then obviously we have uh, games going on right now. It looks like Seattle at two and three is beating the uh, Cardinals. They're two and three. 
and Seattle is now up nine to three over them. Um, got the Cowboys and the Eagles tonight, and I mentioned that because right here at the top of the NFC, you got the Eagles at five and zero. They're the number one seed. The Minnesota Vikings win again today, man. They are looking good. It makes me want to throw up on my microphone, but the Vikings are looking pretty solid. They're five and one. They got the two seed. Uh, five and one New York Giants, those horrible New York Giants guys that they nobody can believe that we lost to, right? They're five and one. They're a good football team. It's time for people to start accepting that. You know, they are who they are. They're they're a good football team. And people, well, they play bad teams and this. Now, okay, keep saying that. Steelers beat the Buccaneers today, right? So the Steelers are two and four. The Bucs are three and three. They get a, a two point win there over the Buccaneers. The Steelers did as they're running through scores here, but Back to the standings. Number three seed, New York Giants at five and one. Number four seed, the Dallas Cowboys at four and one. So you're going to get the Eagles Cowboys tonight. And the best of my understanding, the winner of this game will go to the number one seed, I believe, because that would mean that the Cowboys would have the tiebreaker over the Eagles, I believe. Now that tiebreaker, that's like trying to trying to learn Japanese <laughs> with the way they've got that set up with with the tiebreaker system. I don't have the exact format pulled up right now, nor am I going to, but um, that's going to be a great game tonight. Tampa Bay Buccaneers coming in there at the five seed at three and three. 49ers in the sixth seed at three and three. And the Packers at three and three at the seventh seed. Falcons are just behind the Packers with the Packers for whatever reason having the tiebreaker at three and three. So the Packers are still a playoff team right now. We got to get this ship righted quick, though, guys. It's not the end of the world. Should have got a should have got a dub today, but you got to give credit to the Jets, man. They came out and played their tails off. They really did. So um, sucks. We were hoping to get on here and talk a win with you, but it is what it is. Just got to rebound. You got to bury this game ball like you did the Giants. And and this is called momentum, gang. This is the mo this is momentum in the NFL. You can create positive momentum and negative momentum. That that horrible horrible uh, you know collapse last week in London against the Giants really created some negative momentum, and it carried into this game and it actually amplified in this game. This loss was worse than last week's, right? Scrap it clean. Let's come come back against the Commanders, try to get on track. I'll tell you this. If we can come back and get a W against the Commanders and then somehow, some way, go down there and go up there and play the Buffalo Bills and get a win, get a huge upset win against the Buffalo Bills, I'm not saying the Packers should win it. I'm just saying if they do, man, that could uh, that could really, really turn the tide quick. You know, for uh, just there's opportunity everywhere. It's what, what are the Packers going to do with it? So appreciate you guys hanging out with me on this dark day, man. It sucks, but wanted to get on here and do a, do a post-game show anyways. It was tough. Thought about not doing it, but I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that Fairweather fan. I don't. I'm a Packer fan through and through. And as long as the Packers are playing and I don't have anything crazy on my schedule going on, I'm going to be on here talking post-game show with you guys. So appreciate you uh, tuning in live. Appreciate Mike in the chat, Daniel in the chat, all you guys. I appreciate everybody on Twitter and YouTube hanging out with us. Um, really appreciate everybody who's listening to this podcast on Monday morning. If you chose not to listen to it, I don't know why I'm talking to you. You're not hearing my voice anyway, but I understand. I get it. Um, it's a it's a sucky loss, and there was many times that I didn't want to listen to Packers content after a tough loss on Monday morning. But if indeed you are listening to it, thank you for making us a part of your day. We really appreciate it. So let's uh, like I said, let's come back next week. Let's get us a dub against Washington. Uh, try to get prepared for the Bills to see if we can turn this season around as quick as possible. So thank you guys so much for your time. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. Go Pack Go. Inches to go. The Vader. 17 to 14. Cowboys out in front. Star begins to count. Takes the snap. He's Pass is picked off, and who is it? Big B.J. Raji for the touchdown. Puck fake. Wallace picked off. Nick Collins. Nick Collins on the return inside the 10. Leaps for the touchdown.